There we go. All right. Uh, <clears throat> so we missed yesterday. We I, I did post this video talking about other printer types and options, uh, just a variety of the other kinds of printers. Um, we'll actually spend a little bit of time on some of those uh, as we go through. Um, but it's just an overview of the different types of printers uh, that you might encounter, uh, particularly printers that are at the consumer level. Um, the commercial level printers, they, they start to get much more expensive and, um, you know, I didn't talk about those as much. Um, anyway, here's what we're going to talk about today. Actually, before we do that, um, let's wrap up because the last time we left off with our um, new board. We put a SKR Mini E3 version 2 board in here and it was working sort of, but the screen over here wasn't working so we were having trouble getting our screen let's turn it on um, sometimes we have to pull out the USB card it works now um, so what I did is I have other of these screens right so I have another one over here um, they do have these little reset buttons on them um, I had other cables so I tried a whole bunch of things and in the process of doing that um, everything worked every time I plugged it in, no matter if I used the old screen or the old cable or whatever. But as soon as I mounted it here, then it would go into this weird uh, kind of working state where I could sort of get it to, to do things, but it would quickly lock up. And it turns out that this is a touch screen, right? Um, and when you bolt these four screws, you know, they, they're coming in from the back over here to mount this screen in the bezel here. Um, if you tighten them too much and they're not perfectly flat, then it torques. I don't know if you can tell, but it, it kind of torques this thing a little bit. Um, and it puts enough of uh, a pressure on the screen that it thinks it's always being touched. And that was what was happening. So. If you weren't run into some strange issues with your touch screen and you can't figure out what's going on, there's no firmware problems or anything like that, um, it could be that you just tightened it down too much. So now I've got it in there. It's slightly loose. Like, there, I don't know if you can see it's moving. I could probably tighten it a little bit more. See, it kind of moves in there. I could probably tighten it a little bit more, but certainly cranking down on those screws was creating a problem. Um, and it wouldn't operate now it works you know it works the way you would expect it to um, so now that we've got new board new screen uh, what you would do next is um, you would go in and redo all your calibrations calibrate your e-step and that sort of stuff um, we're not going to do that because we're moving on from our extruder and hot end so oh let me point this out see this little piece of tape right here this tape is just there I mean, it's it's on the cr touch right so this doesn't really i've never had this with a bl touch but i've had this with cr touch they're great except they have a metal probe um and just the fact of this fan running there's there's vibration here right a little bit of vibration from here and you may not can hear it i can certainly hear it you hear the probe when it's retracted you hear it rattling on the little plastic case and it's pretty annoying um so i did print this little guy on thingiverse and it kind of snaps on there and um it will hold it but it's kind of hard to deal with um you know getting it on here maybe if i glued it on or something and you know, but it's kind of kind of hard so you can do that kind of thing but um, it's kind of hard to get to, to attach and it wants to come off. So maybe if you glued it permanently or maybe calibrated this print better or something that would work. There are a couple of other style like this. This one was nice in that it can stay on there. I theoretically, um, it's hard to get on the way they've got it mounted. It should mount from this side, but they've got it mounting from the back side. Um, and then it would just hold the pin in place whenever you wanted to use it. This little guy would lock up and let you use it and then you can put it back down but it keeps coming loose so that's an annoyance with those um 
CR Touch. At least the current version of them, they rattle. And so that's a little bit of a pain. Um, I'm going to turn that off because I don't want to listen to it rattle and we don't need it on right now. Um, so what we're going to look at is um, I've got two topics listed here. I've got hot end discussion and a Bontech extruder. Um, so the hot end discussion is going to be relevant to pretty much any hot end for FDM style printers. They, they all have these same components. Sometimes they're a little bit different looking, um, but they basically have these five components or so. Um, the Bontech extruder is just, uh, I've got videos for different extruders. Um, if you go back, maybe, um, I actually may not have made a video for the, um, last one I did because it was live in class um, but there's several videos on different types of extruder and hot end upgrades that you might want to do um, and so we're going to do the bond tech one today just or well I'm going to look at it I don't know if we'll actually get it installed or not we'll see how long it takes I've never installed it um, so before we get into like taking stuff apart let's look at the hot end itself so I've got oh almost lost, lost the whole printer there I've got this guy. Let's get that off the screen. Here we go. Let's get kind of close down to this here. All right, so this is just a box of parts, nozzles mainly. Um, but this is a really common style. Now this is not a um, official E3D hot end. It looks like one though. So E3D, let me see if I can find their webpage. They make a really popular um, hot end that looks like this one. Uh, let's see. Their site is kind of slow right now, apparently. Here we go. So, you know, this is what ours looks like. The one I have here is not an official one, though. Um, but uh, here, the V6. Um, $50 to $149, depending on what accessories you get with it. Um, but that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, they actually have, if you have the skill to, somewhere in here, they've got the CAD files for everything. I don't see where you get to them, um, but they definitely have all of their stuff, CAD files, where you can draw them yourself uh, or well, create them yourself if you wanted to. Um, this is a knockoff version. Um, I do have a printer that has the official version. The official one is nicer than most of the knockoffs. The knockoffs are much cheaper, like... $20 or less. Um, they are getting to be decent quality, but I don't know. If you're going to change to one of these, it'd be probably worth it to go ahead and get the the full E3D version. Um, they are not the only hot end manufacturer out there. They're just one of the ones that um, is pretty, uh, pretty good. So this one still represents the common parts, even the common parts of what are on your Ender 3 now. They look different on the Ender 3, but they have the same parts. So typically, there's some sort of silicone sock that goes on the heat block. Let's get some kind of pointer. Here we go. On the heat block here. Um, that is, uh, may or may not be on there. Most modern printers do have a um, silicone sock on it that keeps heat um, kind of from radiating out from here. The, the, your heat's gonna be right in that hole right there. There's gonna be one of these type of cylinders. This this is the heater. It's basically just a resistor. There are a couple of uh, different types of heaters. Most of them all look like this on the outside, but they might have different um, wattages. So you might have a, I don't remember what, the 35? I don't remember. No, it's maybe a 18 watt and a 30 watt, something like that. Um, I don't know. Um, so you can get different heater cartridges. They're going to go in this hole, and that's where your heat is going to originate for your um, heater to melt the filament. Um, also over here, you've got these other holes. Um, you're going to have something like this little cylinder here. Um, isn't that a little one? I'm going to have to zoom in to see that. This one's a very tiny one. So you've got that little glass bulb right there. That's your thermistor. Um, this one has a little sleeve that can kind of cover it up so it doesn't, uh, doesn't get broken. Um, so that's your temperature sensor. And it typically goes in 
that little hole right there i guess the for if with this setup if i was if i was using this i couldn't use the little sleeve there i'd have to do something this is taped together so it's making it difficult um, something like that and uh, oh i bet the uh, it's just just kind of clogged up in there there we go and this little guy would just sit in that hole now this hole right here is threaded and so what you can do is you can use a uh, screw with a wider head to kind of lock this in place um, and so that gives you heat going into the block and a way to measure the heat the temperature anyway let's see if we can get that out of there without destroying stuff it's kind of locked itself in there there we go all right so those parts are on all printers pretty much um, heater and thermistor uh, you you've heard of thermal runaway maybe um, or maybe you've read something about it I don't know if I've said anything in this course about it or not but um, thermal runaway means that um, you're heating this thing and it is out of control so it is heating and heating and heating at some point you can put enough heat into this thing to where um, something's gonna give whether or not the, the block here is going to actually melt, you have to put, you know, this is aluminum, so what does it melt at? 600 Celsius, something like that. Um, so you'd, that would be a lot, uh, but something somewhere it's going to give. Um, this thermistor, assuming it's working correctly, um, will measure this temperature of this block, or well, of this little area of the block over here. And um, your firmware should have protections thermal runaway protections that says hey i know i'm adding heat here but i'm not getting the corresponding temperature measurements over here something must be wrong and it shuts everything down um, some of these ender threes and, and i don't know the current ones like the brand new ones they don't have that thermal runaway enabled that that protection that says i'm i'm heating but not measuring changes in heat so shut everything down um, that is not enabled on some of the older Ender 3s. So if you're not sure, um, you should probably investigate to make sure that your printer's firmware, it's the firmware that does this, um, has thermal runaway protection enabled. Um, we just added firmware to ours, so it's, uh, you know, it does have thermal runaway protection. Um, any firmware you add, you should make sure it has thermal runaway protection just because that's the biggest danger with these printers is out of control heating. Um, so if something ever went wrong, like your thermistor broke, came out of the hole, um, just wasn't reading correctly, whatever, um, that's one of the main things that could go wrong. So that's the dangerous things. Like there's plenty of stuff that could go wrong, like just not printing right. But one of the dangerous things that could go wrong is overheating. Um, you know, just this guy heating and heating and heating with no control system to bring it back in line to turn it off when it's gotten to its set point um all of that just just that's kind of an aside to the hot end just that's how that works so let's go back to the other parts of the hot end um so you've got some kind of nozzle um this one is a brass nozzle i'm assuming it's 0.4 millimeters I don't actually, oh, there you can, I don't know if you can, see, oh yeah, you can, you can actually see that pretty well. Um, this one's actually written on it, 0 0.4. Uh, there are all types of nozzles. You know, there's some, there's another 0 0.4, but it's a different color. Um, that one's hardened steel. The, typically, not 100%, but these darker ones are hardened steel. Um, so what you gain with a hardened steel nozzle is resistant to the abrasive material. So you wanna print something that's got a filler in it that's abrasive. Um, pretty much any filler is abrasive, even if you think it's not like wood filler is even abrasive to a brass nozzle. Um, so maybe you've got some kind of uh, filament that is eating away your nozzles and the hole, the little 0.4 millimeter hole here, right there, is enlarging, which is kind of creating problems with your print then you can switch over to one of these hardened steel nozzles and um, that will definitely be much more abrasive, abrasion resistant. Um, the downside is the heat transfer between the steel and they go into this aluminum block down there. 
um, is different and not as good as between the brass and the aluminum. So you lose some of your heat transfer at the nozzle, which is, means you need to do a different tuning. Um, we haven't really talked about PID tuning, but we'll do that shortly, um, mainly because we're going to have a whole new setup here shortly. Um, so you've got all kinds of nozzles. Um, I don't know if I have one of the really fancy um, CHT nozzles in here. This might be one. Let's see. No, that one's... Oh, I can't tell. It's got some filament stuck in it. Um, maybe I can find a picture of one if I don't see one. I think these are all regular. Let's see if I can find a picture. Here we go. So um, these Bontec CHT high flow nozzles, maybe you want to print really fast or really large layer lines, something like that. These nozzles, um, they, uh, they're they silver, so you don't know what material they are. What they are is they're brass, but they have a, uh, I think it's nickel coating. Yeah, here it is, brass nozzle with nickel coated surface. So it doesn't really prevent the um, abrasion problems, but what it does is, not the nickel, but what the shape of this does is, I don't know if you can tell that, can I zoom in and get smaller? Uh, I think I'm maxed out right there. So you see that, those three holes in there? The idea here is if you want to print fast, now these are expensive, $20, I think that's probably for one. It shows three here, but I think that's actually just for one. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just one, even though they're just showing different pictures of it here. Um, so what happens is if you want to print really fast, you've got to melt your filament fast. And um, you can end up in a situation where you're kind of melting the outer core of your or well, not the core, outer core, the outer shell of your filament um, and not the inner core very well. So um, you can get kind of to print, you can get the filament to come out of the nozzle when you're trying to push it through there really fast. Um, but maybe that inner core is not quite as melted as the outer shell and it doesn't print as well. And what this does is it takes your filament and splits it into three small strands right at the nozzle. And so the idea is that you would be able to melt more thoroughly those three individual strands versus one larger filament strand. Um, I do have some of these and they work really well. Um, they're not particularly abrasive resistant because they still are brass at their, you know, their base material. They just have a nickel coating on them. Um, so they, they're, they're an option if you want to try and print faster, like you're just trying to print really fast and you're having melting problems. Um, I'm, I'm sure I have one around here somewhere. It probably is on a printer somewhere and we can't see it right now. Um, but that's what they look like. <clears throat> so you've got all these nozzle options. Um, you do have to be careful. Most of these are pretty cheap. You know, these little brass nozzles, you can get those for a dollar or something. Um, if you're in town in Ruston, um, the only place I know that you can go in town without ordering stuff is A&H Games. They have a selection of nozzles and... Uh, printing supplies and and uh, they have um, filament, they have printers, they have resin printers and supplies. So they have uh, the only place I know of that you can just go to a store and get some of these parts if something breaks. Um, otherwise, you're stuck ordering it from Amazon or wherever. Um, when you do get nozzles, you do have to be aware of, let's see if I can find some examples here. Well, like, like that one, those have really long uh, threaded regions, whereas others may not. Like this, this little guy, much shorter threaded region. So you do want to make sure that you're getting something that's going to be compatible with what you're replacing. Um, most of these will actually all screw in. They mostly all have the same thread uh, on them. I, I have run into some that have a different thread entirely, and they won't even screw into the block that you're using. Um, most now that you run into are going to have the same thread, but they might have different links, which could change some of your um, dimensions that you have to go adjust for. Um, so you've got the nozzle. You've got choices there. Then let's take this next part. You've got your heater block. So typically it's a piece of aluminum. Uh, here's a different one. 
I'm sure I've got some others laying around here. Here's another one. Oh, let's get this guy. This is a smaller one here, if I can get it out. Um, this is a totally different one. This is a much older, what's called a J-head uh, here, but it's got a brass, whoops, off the screen. Blast, brass block, some little blocks, another one of these. Um, so you've got different heater blocks. The whole goal for the heater block is to get the heat into the filament to melt it. So typically you've got some spot for your cartridge, your heater, heater cartridge, uh, to go in, and it's going to be really close to where that nozzle is so that you can melt the filament. Um, so you, there's, uh, there's a variety of these things, and there are some that are, you know, I, I, better than others, I suppose. Um, and there are some that are have intentionally different designs. So these have different materials. Here we've got probably a brass versus most of them are aluminum. Um, you do have, let's see if I can find a picture of this guy, the E3D Volcano, because it is it is physically different. Um, here we go. So this guy right here, need a... Um, it looks like the others. The difference is the heater cartridge is going in this direction. So what happens here is this one <coughs> is turned uh, 90 degrees from what you typically have uh, on your, your hot end. And so the idea here is this is another one of those where I want to print fast or want to print really large layer lines or something like that. Um, and so I've got a longer melt zone. So I li align the heater with the filament coming in here. So I've got more area for that heat to get from the heater into the filament so that I can melt it faster. So that's uh, the volcano and there's a super volcano that does the same thing. Um, I don't have one of those handy to show you what they look like, but, but kind of they look like you took one of these flat blocks and turned it this way and put the nozzle on the end. Um, so you've got some options there. Let's get this stuff out of the way. Um, I don't remember. I think that was the one that went with that. Um, next is the heat break. So this little piece, which probably is going to be hard to get out of here. Um, so you can see the end of it here, right there. Let's zoom out a little bit. So there's the end of that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get it out very easily or not, though, because it's pretty hard to grab a hold of. Um, I don't want to ruin it either. Let me give it a little little try and see if I can get it to loosen up. Yeah, I don't know. I've got some that are already out, so we can just look at them. These are harder to remove just because of the... It's hard to grab onto the threads. All right, so we'll leave that one in here for now. Here's one that, here's a couple that are out. So these, these are out. Here's a different one. Let's get the nozzles back in here. So this guy, the job of these heat breaks, they're heat breaks, is to keep the heat from the heat block. I want heat here. I don't want heat up here. Um, so your filament is coming in from this direction and coming out the nozzle, right? So the heat break is um, here to not, like when I put this on, wow, they were rolling everywhere. When I put this guy on here, there should be a little gap. Well, it's not going to stop because I don't have a nozzle in there. I should have a little gap between the block and the, cool side of the hot end. So um, if I were to run this all the way up here, now if you know your thermodynamics terms, heat transfer terms, now I have conductance between the heat block and this heat sink. So this is a radiator basically to um, cool off this part. Um, I don't want that. So you've normally got a gap between your heat block and your heat sink so that I do have radiation like their heat from the block can radiate up to here 
but it's not nearly as bad as conducting heat between two surfaces that are touching one another. So that heat break is there to create a gap and to be really thin. Usually these are like stainless. You can get these in titanium, all kinds of weird materials, stuff that doesn't have good heat conductance, you know, uh, properties. And um, I can isolate the heat between the heat block and the heat sink cool side of the hot end. I When this thing is printing, I should be able to touch this and it's not, you know, it might be warm, but it's not hot. If this thing gets hot, then you're melting filament in this region and you're not going to be able to push it out the nozzle. Um, and that's a problem. That's how you're going to get clogs or a way you're going to get clogs. Um, this thing can, can overheat if this fan, or where's it? If this fan is not working right. So sometimes this fan goes out. Um, usually what's more common than this fan going out is um, you've disassembled stuff and you took this fan out for whatever reason and you put it back, but you put it back backwards. So instead of pushing air into the thing, it's pulling air across it, which is not nearly as cooling as if I push air into there. Um, so um, there are ways that this can get overheated and you get clogs. But um, certainly if you take all this apart and you reassemble it with this guy touching like that, you're definitely going to have problems because now you're conducting heat into there and no matter how fast you cool it, it's probably going to get too hot. Um, so you want that little gap. And uh, this is the part, this is the part that determines if this thing is all metal. I mean, you look at it and all the pieces are metal. They're aluminum, they're stainless, they're brass, they're, they're all metal. Um, but this guy is usually what it means to be all metal or not. So you might have heard of all metal hot ends um, and you need an all metal hot end when you want to print at higher temperatures. So maybe some of the ABS you want to print or maybe you print a, a whole bunch of PETG and you don't, you're, you're close to being too hot um, or maybe you want to print nylon or something that's, um, got a much higher printing temperature, you have to have an all metal hot end. So if one way to tell if you have an all metal hot end or not is if you can take your tube here and you can run it all the way through, you don't have an all metal hot end. You do not. Um, because this is the part that's not metal. If this plastic can get down to the nozzle, so it's going to end up touching the nozzle, right? Then that is definitely going to be the problem if I try to print at hot temperatures, hotter than like 240 degrees. Um, because now I've got 240 degrees at the end of this Teflon tube. Teflon's going to start breaking down somewhere in that temperature range. Um, none of these are all, this one doesn't do that. So if I put this little heat break in there, um, it doesn't go all the way through but it's because it already has a little plastic insert in there. I don't know if you can tell that that's plastic, but that little white ring, that's a Teflon insert that's already in there. Um, so these are not all metal. I think I do have an all metal one. Let's see, this guy, here's one. This is the Copperhead heat break from Slice Engineering. It is all metal. So. I don't want to lose this one because I think it goes in our Bond Tech extruder here. Wow, they've got it really tight in there. All right, so this one also, I think this one, I think is a bimetallic. I can't tell. Um, so some of these little guys have uh, two different materials for the threaded regions and for the little throat. I can't tell if this one, I don't know that this one is. I'd have to check and see if they're copperhead is a bimetallic or not. It says standard, so I kind of think it's not. Um, it is a different material though than these stainless ones. Um, so uh, this one, there's no, no way that our Teflon tube, I could still have the tube, but it's gonna hit way up here, which is gonna be you know, somewhere in there. So it's going to be very far removed from the really high temperatures of the nozzle. So that would be an all metal uh, heat break. Now you do have to be careful with these because look how thin, well, <laughs> you have to be careful with these. Let's throw it on the table. 
Um, look how thin the little throat is there. Plus, that's the outside. It has this size hole running through it. So that wall is super thin. These, and even these, even these, um, are pretty easy to uh, shear, or at least twist right here. If you go to try to tighten down, you know, you're tightening the nozzle down and you're torquing everything. Um, whenever you're taking one of these apart, um, it should be hot. I know that's an inconvenience, but um, you should have this heat block on, particularly if you're disassembling. So if you're, this should be heated up and then you get you some pliers and you, you hold this guy and un tighten the uh, nozzle. If you don't do that, there's a really good chance that you're going to shear these threads or well, this little throat here, or maybe even this one right in there, maybe even the heat uh, break. You might shear one of those or at least twist them to where they don't work. They're not aligned anymore. Um, so you do have to be careful when you, when you reassemble everything, um, you need to get it heated up again. You can hand tighten and even kind of much, I would just hand tighten most everything, um, pretty tight by hand, uh, you know, just screwing the nozzle in there and the heat block on. But, um, then you need to heat this up and do another like quarter turn tighten on this nozzle. If you don't, then there's a decent chance that you will um, have a little gap between where this sits and whatever it's sitting against the, you know, the, the heat break or the Bowden tube or whatever it's sitting against, uh, you might have a little bit of a gap there and you'll get filament coming out, but you have that gap and it'll create some nozzle clogs. Um, all right. So we're down to the heat break. Then you've got some, some piece, typically aluminum, that's your heat sink. This is what your fan, your always on fan, blows across. At least always on while you're printing. Um, you can set it up to where that fan is not on when the printer is on, like the motherboard is on and the screen is on and all that. It can be off at that point, but anytime you turn the heater on, that fan needs to be running or else that's when you're going to get clogs. Um, so this guy, the whole job of it is to radiate or, well, um, remove any kind of heat that might have gotten up here. You know, you, you are going to get some radiation between your heat block and this part. Um, so if you left it running long enough with no cooling on here, no convection, then, um, it would eventually creep. The heat would creep into there enough that it could cause printing problems. So the whole guy the whole purpose of this guy is to um, uh, keep this side cool so that your filament isn't melted on this side. Then you've got these other little parts like these little couplers and things that hold your Bowden tube in, um, assuming you have one. Um, so those are the main parts of what your hot end are doing. I think it's important to know what these parts are, what they do, so that you can start to diagnose when something might be going wrong. Um, you know, if you just are interested in printing, you don't, you don't, you're not really high performance printing. You're, you're fine to print at the 55, 60 millimeters per second at your 0.2 millimeter layer height. And you don't want to do any of the weird stuff like really fast or really thick layers or something like that. Then you will still pro at some point, even if you don't print abrasive stuff at some point, you'll need to change this nozzle. Um, now that point is much further down the road then uh, if you are doing some of these uh, abrasive materials or really high flow printing or stuff like that, but assuming you keep your printer long enough and you print enough with it, you'll, you'll need to replace this eventually. Um, it's hard to tell when that happens. The best thing you can kind of see is um, if your surface finish, you haven't changed anything really, but your surface finish begins to degrade on the prints, it could be that now's the time to replace this because even with just regular PLA, that nozzle, that doesn't look like a 0.4. Let's see. This doesn't have any, nothing's written on here about what size this is, but that one looks smaller than 0.4. Anyway, that uh, little hole right there is eventually gonna change shape or change size or both. Like it becomes an oval instead of a circle. Um, and so you might get these unexplainable changes in your surface finish. 
it's going to be many rolls of PLA down the road um, if you're just doing PLA. But uh, you're going to have to do something with this hot end at some point, or you're just going to get a clog. Something's going to, um, you're going to run some filament through it that's got uh, some kind of inclusion, like on accident. There's some kind of piece of trash in the um, filament, and it gets lodged in here. So at some point, you're going to have to take this apart. Um, and uh, you just need to know how to take it apart, what the pieces are, what to be careful of, and how to put it back together. Um, all right. Let's look at our upgrade. This is part of the upgrade. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because it's getting hard to keep everything in frame. Whoops. So this is what I've got. I've got two boxes over here. I've got this box with these parts in it. And I, again, I don't really remember. I bought this a while back, so I don't really remember what I was planning. We'll have to see. Um, so there's the Copperhead's heat sink that goes with our Copperhead. This must be a whole Copperhead hot end. Um, I've got some thermal paste. Um, you don't have to use thermal paste, but this is um, helps with conductance. Whenever you want heat to conduct from one place to another, thermal paste can help with that. Um, so I've got a little big piece of that. Here's their um, heat block. Very different looking from uh, what we looked at a minute ago. They're basically trying to force the heat to go exactly into the nozzle. None of this extra stuff over here in the corner where I don't want heat, you know, um, just where I want heat. Um, oh, is this one of the CHT? Yes. All right. So here's a uh, CHT. Um, MK8 talks about the thread size on here. Um, and this is, uh, I think this might be a 0. 0.6 millimeter nozzle. I see 60 on there. I, I think that might mean it's 0. 0.6. Um, we'll definitely have to find out because our slicer needs to know what size that hole is. Um, so we'll have to tell if 60 means 0.6 or not. I have to look that up. Um, and like we saw with this guy, what do we have here? Um, oh, this is just the kind of the uh, capstan part for the hot end. There's some fan related materials. Oh, this is going to take the little blower fan that's on our uh, E3D already um, and adapt it for this hot end. So we've got hot end pieces here. And then I've got this box. We'll have to zoom out to get it in there. Um, there's some instructions. We might need that. Uh, DDX extruder, extruder accessory bag. So we've got a, a stepper extension wire. Um, several little pieces for the extruder itself. Some zip ties little piece of Capricorn tubing. That's uh, This is going to be a direct drive setup, although maybe I didn't. I do have the longer Bowden tube. Maybe I didn't set it up as a direct drive. Oh, no, it's direct drive. So we've got um, this Bontech extruder and a sticker. All right. So I think... I think this might be an older one um, that they may not sell currently, or it's kind of out of, there's a newer one. Let's see. Type in over here to see if I can find what we've got. Let's see. So I don't know if I'll get this all installed today. Looks like this guy, this is version three. I think the one I have is version two, it said. Oh, yeah, it's written on it, version 2. So there is a newer one um, for the Ender setup. Um, so I've got a little bit older one because I bought it a while back. So this is a DDX, so direct drive extruder. Um, what we've been using on our Ender 3 is a Bowden style. So you've got... Look at our printer. You've got, well, I've got a big mess over there. The feeder mechanism back here, you can see the filament coming in, you see the handle for it. 
Um, so there's a stepper motor over here, feeding filament over down into our hot end. Um, so the downside to that is that I've got this tube full of filament and that filament inside the tube is basically acting like a, a kind of stiff spring. And so it's a little bit difficult to control flow rates, things, retractions, stuff like that. Um, the softer the filament gets, so maybe I want to print some rubbery filament, TPU. Um, it is like, uh, not as quite as soft as like a rubber band, but there's some that is very soft filament, um, with these rubbery properties. So, um, maybe I want to print some of that stuff or maybe I just want better control over, uh, retraction settings. I want more direct control from between the feeder and the hot end. So the Bowden tube is, uh, not going to help with that because it's got that, uh, stored energy in the filament between the feeder and the um, hot end and the longer that Bowden tube is the more um, variation I'm going to have and difficulty controlling filament extrusion. So direct drive solves that problem. It adds a new problem that doesn't really affect us here but it does add the problem that now the feeder motor is going to sit right here on the carriage. So that does the good part of like, well, off the screen, the feeder and the hot end are really close together. So there's going to be, you know, I've got this little, little tiny, uh, piece of tubing that will be between them. Actually, this one may not have any tubing at all between them. It looks like it's all built into here. Um, possibly, I don't know if there's any real unconstrained path. Um, but the downside is now I've got this relatively heavy. Now this is a thinner one. So note there's the stepper motor. It's not as um, thick as some of these other, actually it's the same size as this one, but some of these stepper motors are almost twice that length. So they're heavier. Um, this one's geared so that um, it can use a smaller, less torque motor to produce the same amount of force. Um, it does mean I definitely have to change my E-steps though. Uh, and so the downside is now I've got extra weight on this X carriage. So what that'll do is it'll limit how fast I can move, right? Because um, not only do I have to accelerate and decelerate that mass um, without ringing, without vibrations, I have to move it around. So it's going to slow down some of my uh, accelerations in particular. I don't think it'll affect the top printing speed. Um, but, um, it will certainly affect my accelerations. The good part on this particular printer is that I'm probably not limited by that anyway, because I've got an even heavier bed that has to do the same thing. So the bed has even more mass and it has to stop and accelerate in a new direction. So, um, it's probably the limiter anyway. Now, if I'm on a print, uh, printer that the bed does not move back and forth. It just drops down or maybe the bed doesn't move at all. The, the gantry moves, does all the movement. Um, then this kind of thing does start to be the limiter because it is relatively heavy, um, on my print speed. So you get, you trade off one thing for another. Um, these direct drives, uh, you can also get what's called vertical fine artifacts. Um, I'm sure once we get this running, I'll be able to print something and we'll show those. Um, I don't have anything handy that's going to show off that, but basically, um, if you have the, the sidewall of a print, you'll have super thin repeating lines in the sidewalls of stuff. Um, those are vertical fine artifacts that are almost directly related to these teeth right here. And the, the fact that these stepper motors, we haven't really talked about stepper motors yet. Um, but the way stepper motors work is they have discrete steps that they're going to take. Now you can make those steps smaller and smaller, but there's some trade-offs to doing that also. Um, all right, let's see, we've, we're at 844. So we have some time. Um, why don't we start? It didn't have instructions. So we got to go, we got to go look up the, uh, setup guide at Bond Tech. So let's see. It says bontech.se English customer service. No, no, not customer service. Um, I just want 
I just want support.bontemp. <coughs> so we got over here, step-by-step -step guides for Bontech extruders. And um, well, we don't have a mosquito hot end. That's what I, I think I built that uh, last time. How to attach a V. So that didn't really help me. Let's see if we have something else. What is in here? No. Well, that may not help me too much. Let's see. Let's just see if maybe they've moved it somewhere. Let's see if I can find uh, where they might have put this thing. I wonder if they count it as an upgrade kit. LGX. Oh wow, they've got a lot of them. I don't want to just guess at how to put this together, but we may end up doing that. <laughs> so here's the version three DDX. Um, it's probably gonna be very similar to that. I don't know the difference in version two and version three, but I'd like to find a version two if we can. Let's see. We've got a lot of a lot of choices here. There's the adapter set, which is we have one of those, which we may not actually need that particular some of those parts. I don't know. There's the rear housing. We have that. I wonder if I go to there, if I, it will lead me to the other. Uh, the other pieces. Let's see. Uh, um, these are the individual pieces for stuff that's I kind of want the whole thing hmm maybe it's in the creality now we're getting closer I may just have to look at one of the version threes and hope that it's similar enough these are just individual components Yeah. All right. So let's let's just look at one of the um, version three. This is it. I mean, it looks very similar. So let's just look there and see if they've got a setup guide. They have video. I don't like video guides. I guess that's what I'm doing, but um, I don't like them in general. I'd rather have a, a written one. I was reading this about uh, using a bed probe since we did want to use that. We'll have to see if that's going to actually fit. Let's see what's on here. These parts are required. Yeah, we've got we've got those. Well, let's just look at it. I'll see what we can make sense of. I'll probably have to come back and tell you what I did on Monday because uh, I probably can't figure it out um, in the meantime. I at least see how it's supposed to be mounted. That's good. Um, so it does, sometimes you have to take these apart to get, uh, you know, to get them mounted. Sometimes they mount from the back. Um, I can see, I know one thing we'll have to do is Let's take this one off. So I know how to do that. So let's let's look at that, and then that'll give us a view into what's going on in there too. We kind of took it apart earlier, I guess, when we did the um, when we put this guy on. Let's keep that screw.
again this is not necessarily an upgrade that you need to do at all it's just I'm showing you different things you can do and if you want to the, if you've noticed the prices on this it's not cheap this is a hundred and thirty seven dollars for just the um, the extruder part you still have to come up with a hot end to go in it which we've got this uh, copperhead hot end that hopefully will fit in there um, all right so we've got this a loose these two are going to remove the hot end that we have in there um, let's go ahead first though and I want to get this Bowden tube out now if I can uh, just because it's easier to push this down while it's mounted than it is to wait but sometimes these things are really hard to operate like I can't get that to oh wait it did budge all right yeah it's not gonna come out so let's instead let's just loosen this um, if I have a wrench that's gonna fit let me get a let me just get one back here okay all right so a lot of times it's just easier to to unscrew this thing than it is to get the little coupler to release they use very uh, affordable couplers here and they don't always work the way you want them to. Now, there are no, um, quick, like, connections here for your, uh, wires for your heater and your thermistor um, and I didn't I don't think I bought new heaters I don't yeah I don't see them anywhere in here so I'm gonna have to use the existing heater and thermistor in our setup which is fine um, that actually saves me some wiring that I don't have to do you know what I should have done so I should have uh, taken the filament out of here why don't we do that so um, I'm going to heat up this guy to take the filament out. This one, notice it doesn't have a silicone sock. This is a fiberglass. These uh, will eventually wear out on you, tear up. I'm changing the uh, temperature. Just to get this to where I can get the filament out of there. That's going to heat everything up, which is um, hopefully, well, this is not going to cool down because the fan's over here now. We're at 90 degrees. Once it gets to around 170 or so, I should be able to pull it out of there. Some of the parts are, oh, there we go. All right, let's go ahead and get all that out. All right, that will make this, oh, let's go ahead and uh, turn it off. stuck in there so but see how um, you know, it starts this isn't bad worn 
but it's beginning a little bit to wear. One thing on these ends, um, if for some reason you get one and, and you did the end of it's kind of getting mangled up or whatever and you want to replace it, or not replace it, but you want to just trim it back a little bit, you have to make sure that you cut this end perfectly uh, straight. If you cut it at an angle, you know, some kind of crooked, um, when you go to seat it in there, one edge will seat on the, the seat in there, will sit on the seat, um, but the other edge will have a gap and that'll create a clog. Um, they make little um, choppers. Usually if you get a uh, replacement Bowden tube, um, most of those sets, or at least there are sets that will come with a little guillotine type uh, cutter for those so that you can be pretty sure that you're cutting straight across it. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you cut it with something like scissors, then you might collapse it a little bit when you, you might pinch it when you go to cut it. So um, be careful cutting the ends of these tubes if you're just trying to cut back to us, like maybe cut back to here, cut all that part off and cut back to here. Uh, make sure you get a nice, clean, non-crushed part portion. Um, let's see. This is going to be kind of hot now for a little bit. I'm going to remove some of our burned up insulation off of it because there's a screw somewhere that holds our heater in. I think it might be right in here, although it's all covered up, so I can't tell. Let's see. Let me see my scraper. I haven't used this scraper in a while since I had this bed on here. And now I don't see it. Maybe the heat, uh, the screw is on the bottom. Yeah, I think it is. And it's probably a pretty small one. Smaller than that, I think. There's a little screw on the bottom here that's holding the uh, heater cartridge in. And then on the side over here, on this side, there is also a Phillips screw, looks like, that's holding the, um, wow, it's really loose. That's probably okay though. You don't want that one too tight and pinch your thermistor wires. Okay, that little screw held the thermistor in. So it should be, yeah, there we go. So there's our old heater, looking a little, uh, a little worn, still okay. It says the wattage on there, I just can't read it. All right, so now we're down to this guy. We'll get these two screws out. So the pink part here is our um, heat sink and the gray part is our heat block. Even just that little bit we ran it without a fan, the pink part is, is noticeably too warm. It's not too warm to hold, but look how yucky it is. There's the little screw that's holding the um, thermistor in. This one uses a little bit different to kind of heat keep you from shearing the throat here. Um, the This heat block connects to the heat sink with these screws right here, those two. Um, you can kind of see them there and there. Uh, the um, heat brake is connected to this with just this set screw. It's, it's not threaded in that region. So there's kind of what we're dealing with previously. You can get, um, let's see, where is it at? I don't know if I can get it to focus on the nozzle when well, it's focusing on the wrong stuff. 
but um, it doesn't look like the nozzle is worn that badly here. It's very messy, but it doesn't look like it's worn. All right, we're going to put that off to the side. Now let's look and see. I'm guessing these two are going to mount right there. And it's going to just mount directly to that old carriage. If you could get it to line up. It definitely looks like it should do that. Yeah, it's going to do that. So, um, things that that could change is it could change my nozzle height here for sure. Certainly going to move the nozzle forward from where it was because it was way back here before. And now it's going to be somewhere. I don't know. It might be in a similar spot. Um, I haven't built that yet. Uh, this guy looks like it won't mount in the same spot because the the second hole here is kind of covered up by this housing. Um, so I can't do that again. Um, we'll have to see how they intend for this. You know, where is it? They said something about mounting it on the right side over there. We'll have to see. Um, so that's how that's going to mount. We've got to assemble our hot end and get our fan situation sorted out. Um, the front fan here looks like it's just going to jump right into there with no problem. Let's see if we can get it out. There we go. Got to find the right screws. It has four screws in there. It really doesn't need that many, but it's so many it's got. Oh, I think that's too big. Um, if you ever go to change these fans out, this one in particular, one of the things you'll see a lot of people do is put Noctua fans because they're much quieter. Um, and that's true. They are much quieter. The, there's a couple of problems with that. These are 24 volt fans. Uh, so you do have to make sure that you get 24 volt replacement fans if you want to replace it. Or maybe you break this one, you know, break one of the uh, blades off of it or something. Um, so you do have to replace it with the right voltage fan, but then you also have to put it in the right direction. And typically, the right direction is this sticker right here on the uh, fan is going to face towards your heat sink. Bigger fans will have little arrows written on the side. I doubt this one does. We'll get it out there and see. But um, bigger fans will have arrows that show you which way they... Uh, flow air when they're wired correctly anyway. Let's see if this one has that. Left one screw in there. Whoops, lost that screw. All right, so sometimes on this, one of these edges, there will be arrows. This one does not have that. So a lot of these size fans don't have those arrows showing you which way they rotate and which way the air flows. So if they don't, then pretty much it's going to be that this sticker is going to face towards what you're trying to cool. Um, and they've got a, oh, they've got a nice little uh, place to route the wires over here too. I know you can't see that because it's on the opposite of what you're looking at, but there is a little route for the wires and then you just put that guy back in. There's probably some order of operations that I am not following currently uh, that I will have to undo something. But um, probably I don't want this fan because I haven't screwed that in yet. So let's not screw that in because I'm going to need access to back there somehow um, to put the attachment screws in. I'll have to figure that out. Um, all right, so we can do that. And it's, it's going to look like um, this piece. These look like they're SLA printed or SLS printed um, in nylon. Uh, just looking at the surface finish of them. So I don't think these are, I think they print these parts. Um, this is going to mount our part cooling fan. It's going to use the same fan we had before. Oh, that's a really tiny, let's see have one handy that is that small. Um, maybe this 
this one. Little Allen wrenches everywhere. Yeah, there we go. So we won't need our little blue duct anymore. Let's see what time we're at. All right, another few minutes and then I'll close up the stream for today and figure out what order I need to put this stuff together in. But it looks pretty straightforward. Maybe on Monday, I'd like to go ahead and get it finished up though. Um, so now we're done with that piece. But it looks like there's no rewiring necessary or anything. Um, I can use all of the same. I, well, all right, so let me show you the one piece of rewiring that I can see. The one piece that I didn't see is we, they gave us this extension cable. I'm gonna have to extend from here over to where the original feeder motor was plugged in. So that's not a big deal. Um, I can reuse the thermistor and heater that I already have. I can use the fans, they're already wired up. Um, so it doesn't look like there's gonna be any soldering or anything like that. It looks really straightforward to put together. Um, we just need to assemble our hot end and uh, get it mounted in there. This is, I probably should take this off because it's not actually mounted and I'll forget. Um, it's just pressed on there. There's that little routing thing for the fan wires. Um, and it might be that I can put a sensor right there, I don't know. Um, here's what's going on inside of there. You can't really see everything, but um, it has the same type of geared uh, feeder wheels. The other thing it has though is, you can kind of see where this, the center line of the stepper is down here, but the wheel that's actually driving is up here. So this, is geared again i don't know if you can tell but um down in there is well here's the top of it uh there's another gear set so um, i'm getting a gear reduction between the stepper motor and the actual wheel that's doing the driving of the filament so the filament goes in that little groove back in the back um, and i can drive it with a smaller motor so a lighter weight motor um, there's a little spring mechanism here thumb wheel that applies tension on the uh, filament well not tension pressure applies pressure on the filament so i can tighten up how much pressure is being applied to squeeze the filament between those two drive wheels um, and the filament is going to go right in here, get driven, and come out right here. So there's very little, actually there's no unconstrained path. There's very little path where um, the filament is in kind of this, this springy mode of uh, being inside a bowden tube. Um, so we'll work on that. And uh, actually, I think I'll go ahead and, and put it together and let you know if there were any difficulties. Maybe I'll wait because it would be good to assemble the hot end live, but there's only like six minutes left and I don't think I could get it all assembled in six minutes, maybe, but um, maybe I'll wait until Monday and leave the printer like this. We'll see. Um, but we will see you on Monday um, with either more of building this thing or um, it'll already be built and I will have printed something with it and I'll tell you what I did. Uh, but it's a good kit. Uh, it's actually looks like it's going to be all the parts you need. Uh, it's kind of expensive though. Um, you can actually get uh, the same type of effect with the parts you already have on your printer. So um, you can get a direct drive. That might be a good way to spend our last five minutes here. Uh, let's look up. Let's just, I usually go to Thingiverse. Sometimes it's a pain because it gets so slow. But... Uh, Direct drive Ender 3. Let me show you what I'm looking at. So you can actually print a mount that will turn your printer that you have with the parts you already have into a direct drive like this. Um, 
let's see. Well, there's a very complicated looking one, but you can kind of see what they're doing here. Um, there's several of these. I've never done this. I've always just bought the actual kits, but um, let's look at this one and you can kind of get an idea of what, what you, oh, it didn't upload the picture or it didn't load the picture. Mm. There it goes. So see, this is this is the part you've got on your printer, or you, you might have the plastic one still, and we had changed this out earlier. Um, there's your original printer stepper motor. They printed this little bracket that sits on top of your carriage, and they just spit the filament straight out of the feeder right into your hot end. Um, it looks like they rerouted some of the cooling here. I'm not sure that that's particularly necessary. That's um, part. Most of that is just they're redirecting the... Um, layer cooling to both sides um, but you can create a direct drive setup with the parts you already have if you want to just printing out a bracket like this that mounts your feeder basically right on top of your hot end um, so that's what we're doing with these with this this is just a commercial product versus you can do it yourself if you're interested in that so um, you, this is much cheaper it will work um, it will um, remove completely the Bowden tube and it's undoable. If you don't like it, you can re, you know, remount it the way it was before. Um, nothing gets changed permanently that uh, you couldn't undo easily. Basically, you just unbolt this bracket and put the feeder back where it was and stick the Bowden tube back in there. Um, so it is possible to um, do this. Now this one might use a coupler here that you don't have. Um, maybe not. Oh, well it does, does have this um, notice here that you should move the X end stop or else the stock motor is going to hit the frame where the end stop is currently on the X axis. Um, so it looks like they um, added a little piece out here to trigger the end stop early so it doesn't do that got a very nice print off of it with I don't see any of the vertical fine artifacts that you normally get in that print so it's very nice so you can do this they even got their BL touch mounted over there um, oh no that now this one they've got a bond tech extruder on there so this is not your original equipment right here um, so that's a little bit different but this is the stuff you already have. So um, maybe someday I'll, I'll try one of those because it, it would be much cheaper for sure um, to see how they, uh, you know, if they're worth doing. I kind of think it would be okay, particularly if you were trying to print flexibles or um, you just wanted better control over the uh, filament that's coming out. So for whatever reason, uh, you want better control of the filament flow out and retractions back into the um, the uh, the hot end, I guess, the cool side of it. Um, obviously, with if you do change this, your retractions have to be dropped way down. Um, you don't need to retract a couple of millimeters when you're sitting right on top of the um, hot end. You retract like a half a millimeter, maybe. Um, so it's a good option for certain cases particularly if you want to do flexible stuff um, then there is a way to do it without paying really anything other than your time all right we'll come back on monday and um, we'll see what i'm doing with the printer on monday